Welcome everyone. Welcome to the IADI virtual dialogue. Thank you for joining us today. Today's dialogue is on lockdown challenges for land reform beneficiaries in South Africa with Kanyisa Gumedi, a researcher at the Institute of for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies in South Africa. And I know we have people joining us from there today. So welcome. My name is Rowena. I'll be hosting today's discussion. If you're new to EA, it stands for the European Association of Development Research and Training Institute. And it is a network of researchers and of students in all fields of development. And it promotes the exchange of information to strengthen networks and influence decision makers. This virtual dialogue series engages with researchers from all the world who bring different ideas together and predates COVID. I think Iadi were doing this long before everybody jumped on the webinar bandwagon. So if you're new to EADI, it does have a free newsletter. It's a great way to find out about other activities and research. And if you're a student, it also has free student membership for this year. So just a few technical points. And you say we'll speak first for about 25 minutes and then we're open to a discussion. So to tell you a little bit more about Kanyese, he is a researcher, as I said, at the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies at the University of Western Cape in South Africa. And his research is mainly on land and agrarian reform in South Africa. He's undertaken work looking at the nature and the character of land redistribution in South Africa. And his current research is about rethinking agrarian reform in South Africa to ensure equitable access to land. Today, he's going to bring us up to date with what has been happening in South Africa during the COVID restrictions. So over to you, Kaniso. Thank you very much, Rowena. Welcome to everyone who has joined us. It's really good to see some of the familiar faces from South Africa. So as Rowena said, I am from PLUS. We are at the University of the Western Cape. In South Africa, we do research, teaching, training, and policy engagement, mainly on land, fisheries, on natural resources management, and poverty. So today I'll be taking you through some of the challenges that uh, were faced by land reform beneficiaries. But before I do that, I will actually give you a background of our land reform uh, program briefly and then I will drive straight to the challenges that they face. So our land reform program in South Africa is embedded in our constitution. Our constitution in section 25.5, 25.6 and 25.7 actually describes the nature of land reform that we should have in South Africa. So that has resulted into three programs of land reform. The land reform beneficiaries that I'll be talking about are those that have received land through a program called land redistribution. So land, land redistribution is mainly about enabling access to all South Africans. For someone to benefit, they need to be South Africans who are previously disadvantaged. So they apply and then government grant them land. But that program, land redistribution, has undergone a change since 1994. I'll also touch on that a bit. Then we have a, ten a tenure reform. This is just about securing people's land rights, because we know that in South Africa in the past, majority of uh, Black South Africans did not have secure tenure. So the aim of this program is to try and protect their rights from being infringed upon. Then the third program is called the land restitution. This one is about uh, returning land to those communities that were forcibly removed from their land. So uh, before you can qualify for this, you need to prove that you were forcibly removed from that piece of land. So these are the three programs that we have. So the land reform beneficiaries that I'm talking about are those that received the land through the program known as land redistribution. So as I said, the land redistribution as a program has undergone changes since 1994. So when we started between 1994 to 1999, 
we had a program known as Settlement Land Acquisition Grant Program. And then that program was discontinued then in 2000, year 2000 to 2004, we had what is known as land redistribution for agricultural development. So currently, the program that we have is what is known as proactive land acquisition strategy. So the land reform beneficiaries that I'll be talking about are those that received land through this program, which is known as proactive land acquisition strategy that was adopted in 2005, but it was implemented from 2009 until now. What is different about this program is that ownership is not transferred to beneficiaries. The state retains ownership and then land reform beneficiaries, they lease land for a certain period. According to policy, they are supposed to receive a lease, a lease of for three years, five years, or 30 years. But the previous programs that I talk about, SLAC and LRAT, a title deed will be, will be uh, transferred to these, would be given to these beneficiaries. So they will own a land in the sense of the weight. So the land reform beneficiaries that we interviewed, that we talked about were those that we, that, uh, we sampled from a study that we did last year. When Rowena was introducing me, she said that we did a study which was looking at the nature and character of land distribution, where we found that there's actually elite capture in, in land distribution. It has moved from being pro-poor to being pro-elite. Because in the past, the programs that I talked about, especially SLAC, it was means tested. So uh, those who would benefit from that program they had to be poor so uh, before they could be uh, granted land. So the beneficiaries uh, uh, or land reform beneficiaries that we, 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 we interviewed when a lockdown was introduced by government in March, they are from that circle, from, from that sample, the sample that we the land reform beneficiaries that we interviewed for our program, which is for our project, which, which where we're looking at elite capture. So in that program, we actually interviewed about 62 farms. So when lockdown was implemented, we called to some of those farmers to find out how have they been affected by the lockdown in March. Our lockdown uh, has been in levels. It started in level five, which was a complete lockdown where the movement of, for instance, of public transport was uh, restricted. A, a lot of areas had to be closed, but there were some that were declared essential services that, were, that remained open. So now I'll be sharing with you some of our findings from the farmers that we called. And remember, these are the farmers that we interviewed for our project that we published last year, which was looking at elite capture. So then we managed to visit them, but when lockdown was introduced in March, then we called some of those farmers. So we did have some background information on them. So this farmer A, is a, is a farmer that occupies a 473 hectares farm where uh, he produces maize and livestock. Uh, he started leasing this farm in 2008 and currently has an expired lease. You remember that I said through this new program, which is Productive Land Acquisition Strategy, the farmers only lease land from government. But from the study that I said we, we concluded last year, we found that actually sometimes government fails to issue these leases, which actually threatens the tenor security of these farmers. So this farmer, he, he supplies informal markets, which is made up of market traders and street traders. These traders are those, they actually go and buy uh, from the farmer, 
and then they go and sell in the city centers. Hence the word bucket trader. They come with their buckets and they, they, they then collect the produce and then they go and sell in the city centers. Uh, this farmer also uh, supplies street traders. So when uh, lockdown was introduced, the informal sector was shut down. A lot of um, those, actually all of them, those who, were, who are selling in the streets, initially they were stopped. They, it was said that they must not uh, uh, sell in the streets. So the, the cities uh, became like uh, ghost towns because there was no economic activity that was happening. So this farmer supplies them. So what happened was that during lockdown, his access to market was curtailed. And then here I put a quote where he says that lockdown is dealing us a blow. We cannot sell what we planted in the field. We cannot even buy diesel for the tractor in the garage because people are prohibited from moving around. Some of our produce is dead in the field. So now this quote tells us that when the lockdown was introduced, how this farmer was affected. So what is different here is that some of the, your formal retailers, supermarkets, they remained open. So which meant that established farmers, a large scale commercial farmers, they were still able to sell their produce uh, to these shops where people could go and buy. But it was different for these uh, land reform beneficiaries. Another challenge that was faced by these land reform beneficiaries was the issue of access to information. Some of them actually, uh, when we called them, they told us that actually they did not know about, uh, okay, Maybe let me start here. After the lockdown, then government, I think it was a week or two after lockdown, then government indicated that they are going to be offering some relief fund to land reform beneficiaries. So what happened then was that uh, after that was said, that is where actually we went and then called these farmers just to find out if they are aware that there is a relief fund that has been made available for them to be able to continue with uh, production. But what was, what was a challenge was that they had not actually, was that some of them had not received that information. But for this farmer actually re received information just before the closing date. And the, the quote there tells you, because it says they, they gave me a form to apply for the grant today, but the due date is tomorrow. I got the form at the department's offices. I picked it at the gate from the security guard. I received a call from the departmental official. The form requires a lot of supporting documents. As we speak, I still have to go to the bank to get the bank statement, but I cannot go because of the lockdown. The police will block me. So now this shows you that though information or relief fund was to be made available, but farmers still had a problem in terms of accessing information and also in terms of like moving and being able to go then and access those farms. Now I'll move to case study number two. The case study number two also shows the issue of constraint access. Those who had some form of access to markets, but it was a bit uh, limited or it was at their disadvantage. This farmer is a livestock farmer that is a leasing farm since 2015. This farmer does not have a lease and he's a timber and beef farmer. So this is what he had to say. He's, he sells some of his cattle in the auction. So they go to the auction with their cattle and then that is how they buy. But now the problem is that due to lockdown regulations. Now that had to move online. So when it moved online, he says that the prices declined. Before the lockdown, they would sell their cow between 11,000 and 12,000. But now they were selling their cattle between 8,000 and 9,000, which meant that if they sold 10 cattle, 
then they will lose about 40,000 rand, which is a lot of money. And then we ask them about the government support, like the government support, that government had hinted that he was going to be giving to uh, the farmers. Then he indicated that usually there's a problem because the government, when they offer the support, they provide vouchers. And when they provide these vouchers, they prescribed. They prescribe that what the farmers will get and where they will get it. For instance, they would say that the farmers will only receive medication or they will receive feed. So this farmer was saying that the problem with these vouchers is that they are prescriptive. We will be told what to get, where to get it. They should make these vouchers flexible. The farmer should be allowed to buy what they need, not what the voucher is for. They would provide you with a voucher for feed, but only to find that you have feed. So what this farmer actually was saying was that the government needs to consult before they give them vouchers. And these vouchers have to be flexible. They have to be based on the need of the farmers. And then we have pharmacy. This pharmacy, she plants vegetables. She also has crops such as beans and uh, also engages in poultry production. And uh, her lease is an expired caretakership. She has an expired caretakership that she got in 2015. So what happened with this farmer was that she supplies formal markets. You remember that I said that your formal supermarkets, they were declared essential, essential services, so they remained open, which meant that they were able, they, they still continued to provide food to the society. So this meant that for farmers that are supplying such markets, land from a beneficial that supply such markets, they had their access to those markets undisturbed because they were declared essential service. So when we called to this farmer, this farmer said that I do not struggle with markets. I have touch contracts with spa and other shops around. I also produce cabbage eggs and beans. My produce is not yet ready, but they have already started to call me to find, to find out if it is ready. And this farmer also had a permit. But what was uh, the problem that she faced was, then was that she had access to markets, but he, her workers could not move because a public transport had been stopped. There was no public transport. So she was saying that usually she has 35 workers, but now she only had 11 workers. So what we are seeing from these different case studies is differentiated access to markets that is based on the market that the farmers are supplying, which then actually it gives you an idea that formal markets are more prioritized than informal markets. But we know that from research that about 70% 70, 70 of poor households in South Africa actually source their food from informal uh, markets. So here I share with you the pattern that we picked from these farmers with regards to the challenges that they faced. Firstly, when the lockdown was, was introduced, as I said, for, 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 uh, informal sector was closed down and the formal large-scale commercial farmers were given a permit to operate. But these farmers had their movement restricted. This movement did not only restrict the farmers, but also farm workers, as you saw on the previous case study that I shared. The, mainly the, the restricted movement for farm workers was because the public transport had been stopped. 
there was no public transport for them to move around. But as we moved uh, through the lockdown stages, as I said, we started in, in, in lockdown stage five, which was hard lockdown. Then public transport was made available. Actually, after a week or two, the informal se sector, they were also permitted to go, to go back and trade. Yes. So what we are seeing here in terms of like the challenges that they face is that there was a loss and disturbed access to markets. As I've shown with uh, the, the case studies that I've shared with you. So the loss of, of markets was not only for the market traders that I told you about and, and street vendors, was that some of these farmers actually provide or sell their produce to, um, at, at, the, at the pension points. They go and sell it there themselves or they sell it to bag traders who go and sell in these pension points. By pension points, I mean where people go and collect their social grants. We have a social grant program in South Africa for those who are old aged and also for children. So there are pension points. In these pension points, this is where the bag traders sell and street vendors who buy from land reform beneficiaries. We also have a school nutrition program. Uh, the school nutrition program is available in some schools where meals are provided to students. So some of the, uh, the land reform beneficiaries sell to those uh, service providers, so those who, who provide nutrition to schools. Because of the lockdown, some of the traditional ceremonies had to be stopped. And some of the farmers, especially livestock farmers, they sell their livestock uh, to uh, communities or individuals who come um, so that they go and perform their traditional ceremonies. Another challenge that was, that was shared to us by uh, land reform beneficiaries was that uh, there was an increase in livestock theft, especially for those farmers who have communities around them. This was because during lockdown, people were not working. And as they were not working, they did not have any form of income. And this then uh, resulted to some communities going and stealing from the land reform beneficiaries. One beneficiary was telling us that actually uh, he came across a sheep that had been slaughtered. But then he realized that no, actually uh, it's maybe people from around because uh, people had lost their income. Um, our government actually introduced a food relief voucher in order to support some of, um, to support uh, people who had lost their jobs. And they also came up with a food relief, cash relief fund as well, where people were, were given some uh, cash. So this, there was a bit of failure from government to redistribute, to distribute these food vouchers. So that was actually indicated by one of the uh, land reform beneficiaries as one of the reasons maybe for people to steal because they did not have food, they had not received the, uh, food, uh, the food relief uh, voucher from government. Um, with regards to the prices for the livestock, as you saw in the previous case study that I shared with you, there was a reduced price for livestock. But what was worrying is that actually amidst prices, in, in these formal outlets actually had increased, which meant that uh, while the farmers were losing, but these formal retailers, formal supermarkets were making profits. So what we are seeing here is that the dominance of the, the, the formal uh, sector and it's benefiting out of this uh, crisis. Some farmers had, a, because now they were not able to sell their produce, then they, they, they did not have money to pay some of their workers, especially those who had workers around that could just work on the farm. Uh, they, they did not have cash because they were not able to sell some of their produce, which then became a problem. Some of the farmers, some of the input suppliers had to close down because of the a lockdown regulations, which then limited access for the land reform beneficiaries to be able to buy uh, input. So another a big thing that happened was that 
the budget, there was a revision in terms of like the budget for the department as a whole, it was reduced uh, with about 2 billion, which that on its own is a problem because it means it meant that less support for the farmers. So this is the government intervention that I was talking about that was introduced after a lockdown uh, it was implemented. It was about uh, 1.2 billion, which is about 600,000 uh, in, in, in terms of dollars. So each 400 million of, of from that would be for the plus farmers that I'm talking about, and then the rest would be for smallholder farmers. Because in South Africa, we also have like your smallholder farmers, those who produce the crops for their own uh, consumption. It may be crops or, or it may be a, a livestock for their own consumption, but there are others that also sell uh, their produce, so those who are commercially oriented. And they, in total, they are estimated to be about uh, uh, 2 million. So these vouchers that I was talking about was um, uh, about uh, 50,000 for each farmer. So this meant that each farmer would receive 50,000 rents, which is roughly about 3,000 US dollars. So what we got from the farmers, as you saw, it is that for, for, firstly, it is insufficient, it is not enough, it is pres prescriptive, and sometimes it is of poor quality. And some of these input suppliers actually tend to inflate prices because these input suppliers, they are appointed by government. So when the farmers go there, they want to buy something, then they, they, they want to take using the voucher that is provided. Then they find that actually the price has been inflated, which shows that actually the government or oh, that government needs to monitor these suppliers. And another challenge with the government intervention or the relief voucher that I'm talking that I was talking about is that in terms of like information, when we were calling our the farmers, we realized that actually the elite farmers, those who do not have access to land, those who do not have sorry access to information. That information was, did not reach them, and you saw with the previous case study that some actually got that information very late. So one farmer, when he was uh, reflecting on the government, and what was saying that the government must consult with the farmers, and they must not decide on behalf of the farmers what it is that they, they need, because uh, they were providing them with seeds, providing them with medication, whereas some of them would have... Uh, needed, for instance, uh, cash vouchers to be able to pay their workers because they indicated that actually one farmer was telling us that he already had feed, but now still he knew that he was going to be given feed. So there's a need to consult them. But there are some of the positives um, after is that the, the, the period for the vouchers was extended when they realized that some of the farmers had not actually managed to exchange them on time. And we've also had that there would be a second round of application. Maybe as a way of uh, conclusion, I will, I will, I will um, uh, uh, conclude by recommendations or, uh, that are based on what we learned with regards to, the, to uh, providing support when uh, farmers face these challenges. But it is important that farmers are consulted and the support must be flexible, it must be based on their needs, and there must be recognition of different production systems. Here we mean that actually some of the input suppliers were not providing, were only providing inputs that are mainly used on, for providing inputs that are, are not organic. So which meant that those who want to engage in organic farming, they did not have. It's important that maybe in some cases they should offer cash relief based on the need of the farm because some farmers would like to uh, compensate, to use that cash to compensate their workers, especially when they have what government is providing at that time. And another thing is the issue of uh, securing access to markets for farmers, which can happen through government procurement. Government must make sure that it targets land reform beneficiaries and smallholder farmers not only purchase produce from established farmers, because uh, for most of the established farmers, 
it is true that they were able to continue to supply their produce to these formal markets because the markets were available. But that was different for, for farmers that do not have access to these formal markets. And it's also important to provide tenure security. As you saw that most of these farmers, these case studies, all of them, nobody had a valid lease. All of them. So which meant that even if they wanted to try, maybe access credit, it was going to be a problem. But it is also impo important that government uh, designs the programs to ensure that farmers have access to credit so that they are less dependent on the government. Maybe throughout my presentation, you realized that there seems to be a bit of a, a non-recognition of informal uh, sector or informal food systems. That needs to change because as I said earlier on, uh, research tells us that 70% of our poor households source their food from informal sector. So there's a need to uh, recognize them because what happened is that after lockdown was declared, informal traders were stopped. But after some uh, organizations like your C19 coalition made a noise around it, then that is only where government allowed them to continue to, um, to trade. But from the start, it showed you that government does not necessarily uh, recognize informal, foods, informal sector. So that needs to be to change. And alternative food systems need to be supported, especially a local food system. There's a need to democratize and transform the food system. Uh, thank you very much. I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Kanyiso. That was brilliant. And thank you for bringing all of the, the varied challenges um, for South African farmers to, to light for us. I'm going to open up for questions now, but while people are thinking of their questions, I just wanted to ask you, you have some excellent recommendations there. Um, to your knowledge, has the government asked, the South African government asked for help um, to understand some of these challenges from PLAS and, and other researchers so that if this happens again and you have to go back to lockdown level five, that they can be prepared. Do you know if that has taken place? Thank you very much, Rowena, for that question. Yes, it, it has happened. Actually, after a week after a lockdown was declared, an organization made up of civil society organizations academics, yeah, it was a combination of civil society um, organization, academics, and some of the um, activists, yes, activists, that's the word that I was looking for. Yeah, and they, they, they actually tried to um, reach out to government. A lot of opinion pieces were written, and um, some organizations tried to reach out to government. And then government, uh, then ended up uh, providing a, a, what they call a multi-stakeholder platform, which is known as LEMNES, uh, which is a network of uh, civil society organizations and academics and activists. So f since then, uh, there have been some meetings through this uh, LEMNES uh, platform, I know, with the minister. So some of, for instance, the fact that there might be a second round of support for farmers because some of the farmers did not uh, get support. If you can see at the bottom of the screen, out of 55,000 applications, only 15,000 farmers uh, benefited. And in, in this 55,000, a large number of um, farmers, uh, land reform farmers and smallholder farmers uh, had not benefited. So a government is uh, listening. Thank you. That's great to hear. Uh, do we have any questions from the, the floor? In fact, a question has just come through. I'm going to read it out to you. Are there examples where digital vouchers have been used? So uh, transfers through mobile money instead, would that be a more efficient way to reach farmers faster? And with that in mind, what roles do you think digital technology can play to support farmers? Thank you, Artie, for that great question. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, what they were doing in terms of like 
distributing vouchers was that people had to physically go uh, to the offices to collect them, or in some cases, they had to be assisted by departmental officials. Uh, the reason why maybe they have not used the digital vouchers is that, yeah, there's a bit of disorganization on their side when it comes, for instance, having a database of these farmers. About their databases are not up to date. Um, sometimes you find that there are some farmers that are missing. So what they will need to do in order maybe to move digital, they'd have to maybe address some of those challenges to make sure that they have information of all the farmers so that when tragedies is, is such as this one strike, then they are able maybe to distribute to some of these the vouchers digitally. Yeah, but it can help. So there's a need for government to be more organized, have a proper da database for these farmers so that they'd be able to distribute them. Thank you. So cl yeah, clearly a role there in, for the South Africa government, but I know many other countries too have realized that the, the data they have on their citizens is absolutely critical when there's a pandemic like this. And we have another question. It'd be good to have a little more uh, information on how the formal versus the informal farmers coped. So what agency did, do informal farmers have? Uh, and you talked a little bit about the activism that took place there, but was that informal or, or formal? And was there uh, any gendered effects? So how did um, the response vary and the impact okay. vary according to gender? Okay. Uh, uh, on the formal versus informal, firstly, as I said, after the, the lockdown was announced, there were regulations which specified who will continue to trade and who will not. So for formal farmers, I don't know whether it's because they are organized, because they are highly organized. They have a, an association that represents them. I think maybe that is how they declared essential service just at the start of the lockdown. And they were also issued permits so which meant that they were able to move around. And some of them have uh, farm workers staying on their farms already, which meant that in terms of labor, labor was available, it was there. But for these farmers, some of their workers, they commute. So when a public transport was stopped, it meant that some of the farm workers could not go to work. So that's the difference between formal and informal. And another difference is in terms of access to markets. But by, by um, the farmers, like your established commercial farmers, their access to, to market was not interfered with since supermarkets were declared an essential service, which meant that their produce, they're able to send it there, they had permits to move around. But I must say that it was different for some farmers that, for instance, that are involved in floral culture. Since a lot of activities that would have needed flowers, for instance. And yeah, yeah, I think that is how like your established farmers were affected. In terms of like a, a gendered impact, in land reform, one of the findings that we also found when we're doing our research on the projects that I'm talking about on elite character is that there's a dominance of men in land reform. Actually, the official figure is that only 23% of land reform beneficiaries are women. And most of those women are not necessarily poor women as was initially the aim of land reform because land reform, when it was started, the main aim of that, it must also benefit particularly rural women. So uh, when we called some of the women, most of them indicated that, for instance, a case study number three, this farmer is a woman. This is a woman. But what is different about her is that we found that actually she has some political connections. She is actually a, holds a particular portfolio for 
a certain political party. So which meant that that somehow advantages her. But for, for other, uh, or oh, she's also an elite who, who is just diversifying into, into farming. Or maybe I can put it this way. She was affected differently to those who are poor because one of the poor women that we talked to, actually she had not heard about uh, the program itself. And then later on, she sends me an SMS which said that she was not going to be uh, getting um, land reform, uh, land reform vouchers or land reform support vouchers. Yeah, so that's that's the difference or the the, the gender um, difference. Thank you. Thank you for that, and I hope that answers your questions, Artie. But do feel free to come back if there's anything remaining. A question now from Rick. Uh, how far has understanding changed of the role played by informal producers and food distribution systems? Oh, thank you very much. Okay. The role that is played by the informal producers, I cannot lie that I have any figures, like figures uh, or statistics with regards to that. But what we know from one report by Pick and, Pay, Pick and Pay, is that informal sector, I'll talk about informal sector and then I will come to the informal producers. Informal sector is worth about 360 billion per annum. And as I said earlier on, 70% of uh, poor households source their food from the informal sector. But when it comes to like the informal producers, I don't want to lie and say that I know how much exactly they are contributing because we, we, we do not have a statistic. But what we know is that when you walk in any of the South African cities, you can see a lot of informal traders who are in most cases are supplied by these informal uh, producers who are uh, constrained by land, who are constrained by production support, uh, who are constrained by access to, to markets, who are constrained by access to, to finance. Yeah. Thank you. Can you say, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the labor market. So maybe not just in tier five, but as the restrictions eased and there was a little bit of movement of people, we yeah. noticed in, in many other countries that migrants, undocumented migrants, migrants without papers, were, you know, going underground, were, were keeping away, they didn't want to be checked at, you know, roadblocks and such like that. And I know that the farming sector often relies on both official and unofficial migrant workers. So I'm wondering, was that a factor for, for some of the farmers that you were speaking to as well? Oh, yes. Maybe just to go back to the, a bit to the question that Eric was, was posing with regards to like the whether after this there's been a changed understanding on the role of uh, played by informal producers. Um, I'd say that I think that maybe there will be some form of recognition now that informal producers are important because they've realized that the formal producers or the formal market do not reach everyone because we, we actually learned that a lot of people had their access to food constraint. So I can only hope now that uh, their role will be more recognized and more understood. Yeah. Now, uh, coming to your question about migrant, uh, about migrant workers on the issue of labor. I must say that most of the migrant workers that work in, in South Africa, most of them they stay on farms. They stay on farms. And the land reform beneficiaries that we interviewed, none of them had migrant workers. All of them actually had lost the number of workers after the transfer of land tends to be reduced because some of them fail to continue to produce um, on a light scale because of constrained post-settlement support. But for, for some of the migrant workers who are actually involved in the informal sector, 
we learned that some of them who actually go who are cross border migrants, they collect their um, produce. For instance, some of the fish farmers, they go and buy fish from neighboring countries and then come back and sell it in South Africa. They were greatly affected when lockdown was introduced because security was heightened along the border, and which meant that most of them could not cross border and be able to come and sell. And another um, challenge that they faced, some of the migrant workers, because all of, most of them are in, employed in the informal sector. Since the informal sector was shut down, most of them did not have access to any income. And they could not be reached by government programs. As I said, government came up with food relief voucher. They also came up with cash relief voucher that were only available to South Africans. So that on its own, I think it presented some problems for uh, the migrant workers. Yeah, thank you. And we have a, a comment there from Rick. Definitely seems that we need better understanding about the source of the food distributed through informal food distribution systems and, of course, the lack of reliable data, which prevents us from mapping food production yeah. and distribution systems indeed. Any other questions from the audience? At yes, this that is true. Rowena, can I say, can I say a bit about that comment? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, at, uh, currently at PLUS, we have a research project where we are going to be looking at the food systems, particularly the informal food systems. I think that will help a lot in terms of understanding about the source of food distributed through informal food distributions, as Rick is suggesting. Uh, that project, I think it has already resume, resumed. It's a one-year project. So we think maybe from there, we might be able to map um, production and um, distribution of food, like in the food systems. Yes. That's great to hear. While everyone's thinking, can you say, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about where we are now. So you're obviously not in, I think you're not in level five. Yeah. You talked about some of the organization that was happening. So I know I read on the PLAS website that some of the small scale farmers were, were establishing depots. They were using WhatsApp and Excel and things like that and organizing. Now that you're not in the extreme level, I think you're in level one, is, are those yeah. sorts of systems still working? Are the, the small scale farmers still working together? Are the informal sector working together? I think what I can say now, especially with regards to what you just talked about now, is that we have local food systems where people are producing food and they're selling directly to the uh, customers or to the people. But the problem is that this system or local food systems have not been supported enough by government. For instance, uh, those who want to engage in local food production have been constrained by a land, they've been constrained by access to markets, they've been constrained by access to, to finance. Yeah. But what we know is that there are some of local food producers who are still continuing, who are selling at local level, but the only challenge is that they are not being supported. So now what we are calling for is that government should actually recognize them as real farmers, because that's the problem that we have in South Africa. Smallholder farmers are not recognized as real farmers. Um, the government supports tends to, to be geared more amongst the large scale more towards those who engage in large scale production, those who engage in large scale production. They are not receiving enough. There's a study that was done by Rick Rick, um, the one who was asking question here, together with Professor Ben Cousins, which actually showed that some of 
the, these smallholder producers, they are able to even create jobs. Yeah, so what is needed by government is to maybe sometimes some, subdivide some of these farms so that some of the smallholder farmers have access to land and the government must also provide them with support so that they are, they are able to be productive and also be supported with access to water because some of them, they don't have access to it. Yeah, thank you very much. Do we have any final questions for Can you so speak now or wave or raise your hand if you're shy and don't want to speak? I want to use this opportunity for if, to, to let you know that there are a series of virtual dialogues on COVID-19 continuing with the Yadi. There is one on domestic workers in Latin America. I think there is even one tomorrow looking at democracy in Europe. So do check out their website or even better sign up for their newsletter to, to find out about future events taking place. And if there is no further questions and I can't see any hands waving at the moment, then it leaves me to thank Kanyiso for his time today. We're really grateful. And thank you everybody for making time. I know there's a lot of webinars out there. Thank you for joining this one. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.